Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So in the short space of time I've got with you this afternoon, I, I kind of wanted to pick up two themes. The role that I have, the role of the regional schools commissioners uh, under my leadership, um, and the, the phenomenal rise that we're seeing across the country uh, of new and existing multi-academy trusts. So if I start with this slide, first of all, here, when I was appointed, having had all of my background in schools, I've been a teacher, a head teacher, and a CEO before I came into this role. One of the things I know when you're trying to lead change in any organisation, but certainly when you're trying to lead it across a whole system, is it helps if you've got a couple of anchors to really think about what the plan will be built around. And so the, the two things which are the priorities for me are these two things here. On the left-hand side, how do we grow the capacity of our system with care? so that we know that we need more multi-academy trust, we know we need more sponsors to support schools that are not yet good enough, um, but we need to make sure we do that really carefully and that we, we, we ensure that the right schools and the right individuals are leading that expansion. But if we simply put all our energy into growing the system, but we don't think enough about how we're going to improve it, then actually all we'll have done is to have another debate about structures. And our education system has been debating structures for about 50 years. And we've got to be talking about how structures lend themselves to improving standards. And so these are the two priorities that I've been talking about for the last six months. How do we grow the system and the capacity of the system? And how do we use that capacity to make a really significant difference to the education of young people? So the Regional Schools Commissioners, uh, if you're not familiar with, them, with that group, there are eight of them all together. The country, England, is divided into eight regions. The Regional Schools Commissioners, of which I was one of the first, I came into the South West in September 2014 when we were appointed. And we came in with this brief, which is pretty straightforward and still true today, which is to how to make, we make sure that we intervene in academies and free schools that are not yet performing well enough. And if you think about the vision that most academies will have articulated at some point when they became academies or joined multi-academy trust, their vision would have been to have made a difference to the communities that they serve. Um, and if they're not delivering on that promise and they're not delivering on that vision, then that's the role that uh, we need to be playing in terms of challenging them to get better quickly. The second point is around how do we take decisions on the creation of new academies. And that happens in two ways. A significant number of the 6,500 academies have chosen to convert uh, the, 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 the law and the legislation changed after the 2010 election when Michael Gove was Secretary of State that uh, outstanding and good maintained schools could convert to be standalone academies. Um, so that's one group and a sizable group of the academy uh, group in, across the country. And the other is those that are sponsored academies because their performance over time uh, was so dismal that we needed to find a new way to fresh start and find them a sponsor, find them a trust and make sure that somebody else was working really closely to ensure that standards in that school uh, got better. And then that takes me to the third one, which is about so how do we make sure we've got enough sponsors and we have enough trusts ready to look after those schools? And around that is how do you promote and support new models of system leadership? In 1997, uh, when I became a head teacher for the first time, becoming a head at that time, that was the ultimate accolade in the profession. That's not true anymore. Uh, of course people can still be head teachers and principals, no doubt about that, but they're also now leading more than one school as executive heads or as CEOs, or they're becoming regional schools commissioners, or they're becoming national schools commissioners. So the background from the school setting is now much, much more diverse in terms of career progression than it was in, in, in the last 20 years when I uh, stepped into headship for the first time. So if I just pick a bit more of the detail around that, um, and what I want to try to do is to pick those three things that the RSCs do and talk about what they might do in a typical week. And the intervention work is only really where we're seeing evidence that performance is weak. So when people are asking questions like, well, okay, there are 6,500 academies and there are eight RSCs and you, how are you overseeing 6,500 schools? Well, the answer is we're not trying to. The answer is that we're trying to have a really close working relationship with those schools that we know need help and need support. So the, the intervention is around those schools that are in Ofsted category, um, that are judged to be requiring improve, improvement by Ofsted, or where their performance shows that they're below the national floor targets. And the sorts of things that the RSCs would do would be to look at what the trust, the multi or the single academy trust is saying, because those are the people we need to hold to account. So of course we shine the light on what the leadership in a school or a trust is doing. 
But the funding agreement that those academies signed was with the Secretary of State, was with the boards that they created to oversee and hold to account the educational leaders. So understanding about what the trust response is, visiting the schools themselves to get an understanding of where they are, looking at what school-to-school -school support is available in that locality, about how we help people move quickly to improve their standards, are all part of the toolkit that regional schools commissioners will use. The taking the decisions on new academies goes through a meeting of the head teacher board. Each of the regional schools commissioners has a head teacher board to advise them. And these are generally made up of between six and eight board members. Four of them are elected by their peers from the system. Uh, and between two and four are co-opted or appointed by the RSEs. Usually, as it was in my case, to look at the gaps that we had in terms of our knowledge base. So in the southwest, for example, when I took on that role, we didn't have anybody from a diocese. So that seemed to be a logical uh, starting point to appoint somebody who could advise us on, on, on church schools. Um, we didn't have anybody that had experience of working in the special needs or special school sector. So we appointed somebody onto the board who came from that background. And the group meets once a fortnight. And its job is to review the applications that come through from schools that wish to convert, they're choosing to convert, or those schools that we know need, we need to have an academy solution for, and where the right sponsor or the right multi-academy trust is for those groups. And what that board brings is real quality local intelligence, because it's head teachers who are still doing the day job, often working across the region, who will understand some of the challenges that need to be met if you're going to move into this space. The board, as I mentioned before, has this balance of elected and co-opted and appointed colleagues. And the role itself on the right-hand side isn't just about the board meetings. So the head teacher board members will work for the RSCs for around about 40 days a year. And we use them also as a field force to go and visit schools, to provide some advice and some guidance, to help schools access the support from a teaching school alliance, if that's what the appropriate thing is that needs to be done. So those eight people um, provide a huge system leadership role to give the RSCs the capacity that they need to act quickly, particularly when performance has been poor. If I move on to the sponsor market, this is, this is a really important part of this, because I think the, the, the position of being a sponsor in our education system has to be a really high bar. And I think there's always that balancing of we know we need more, and we've got more people that would like to do it. But actually, it's for me, the people who are doing the best work and have a track record of outstanding success that should be doing this. But we need to build these, uh, these, this, these sponsor capacity through a really strong regional strategy to recognize where we have some gaps. So the question that I'm sometimes asked about is, you know, do you think you have enough quality leaders to lead a number of schools that you're going to need going forward in the future? And the answer, if you look at it as a numerical answer, is yes. The challenge, however, is they're not in the right place. So in the southwest, which is a region I know obviously particularly well, having just left it, then there are areas in Bristol, in Taunton, in Bridgewater, Cheltenham, Gloucester, parts of Exeter, where we have more supply of sponsors and maps than we probably need. But the moment you step out of Taunton, go down the road to Minehead, or head down towards Weymouth and Portland, or go down to deepest, darkest Cornwall, it's a bit more challenging. So how do we ensure that our strongest leaders have an influence in those areas is quite a key part of the strategy that I'm trying to build. So we have to be sure that when existing sponsor trusts want to grow, that they're ready to do so. Because here's the dilemma, here's the challenge. When you are leading a multi-academy trust, as, as I've had that experience personally, you have a balance between the children that you already educate and your responsibility to those children, which is greater than the, the responsibility you have to children who you might educate in the future. And you've got to get the balancing act right of growth and capacity in a trust whilst maintaining the standards for the children that you've had for three or four years before you think about going further. And I've spent quite a lot of time in the last six months trying to think about that. And I wanted to just put that into context about my strategy for how we're going to do this nationally. So I think um, it's important to understand where we are. So there are a thousand, just about over a thousand multi-academy trusts. 85% of them are made up of five schools or less. So the notion that uh, sometimes we hear about in the press, that there are large national chains hoovering up schools around the country is just ridiculous. It's not true. 85% of our mats have got five schools or less. They are in the same location. They're in the same community. They have similar cultures, similar values. They serve similar communities. They've been working together for 10 years. But the pattern is this. I'm going to call the first group of schools that set out on that journey starter trusts. 
That will then grow into the next phase, which I'll call established trusts, into my third phase, which is regional, and my fourth phase, which is system. And you'll see on the slide that whilst I put the numbers of schools on there, because that's helpful to get a guide, I always try to talk about the number of children as well. Because if you're talking about a starter trust of five primary schools in Cumbria, that might be no more than 250 children. If you're talking about a starter trust of five secondary schools in London, it could be 6,500. And in terms of how you make your mat really drive through the economies of scale, but also have an, an economic delivery model, then the number of students that are in the trust is really important. And I think it starts probably as a first base that you need to get to around about 1,000 children in order to be sure that you're both economically and educationally viable. And so a lot of those trusts that are five schools or less are in my starter or my established range. And, and before they grow, they're going to undertake a health check, uh, which we are piloting right now. In fact, we started our second phase today. And the, the health check is going to pick up on these five areas. People and leadership, have you grown your own, to, to put it bluntly? Have you built capacity? Or are you reliant only upon advertising and external recruitment? The second one is really important. It's the track record and, and performance. So if a, if a trust is performing with some of its schools, where the schools are performing worse than they were when they joined, why on earth would you think we give you more schools until you've demonstrated that you can effectively deliver school improvement? The third area of the health check is around governance, the fourth around risk, and the fifth around financial stability. And my thinking would be that a trust, having gone through that health check uh, and that process, which we will start rolling out nationally in the new year, should be in a position to make the right decision about whether they are ready to grow or not. Because when we talk about some of the large trusts that emerged around about 2008, 2009, um, and that was the era that I started out on this journey, the accusation that's sometimes levelled at them is that they grew too fast, too quickly. That's not what I see. Yes, growth was, uh, was rapid, without a shadow of a doubt, but there were some fundamental mistakes that those early trusts made. The first mistake they made was they gave the same level of autonomy to their outstanding schools as they gave to their special measure schools. Why would that ever work? The second one was they didn't have a school improvement strategy. There wasn't a trust model of how we were going to improve schools. It was a composite of what all the schools said they were doing. Now I would expect a multi-academy trust to not only know what their school improvement model was going to be, but how they were going to work with their weaker schools to improve them quickly. And the third one was partly related to growth, but the geographical dispersal of schools. So some of those early trusts had schools in Lincolnshire and Grimsby and in Devon and Cornwall. How on earth can you make those people feel part of a family when you're 400, 500 miles apart? So I'm thinking that the strategy for growth is going to help us grow the right trusts at the right pace at the right time. And on the ground, the successful multi-academy trusts do many of these things. I won't read the slide to you. I'll just pick on a couple of them. The first one, I think, however, is really important. The collective responsibility for more children that can be taught in one school. So in the Cabot Learning Federation, which was a trust that I ran in Bristol before I came into my, my Southwest role, um, we had 12 academies at the time that were predominantly in East Bristol and South Gloucestershire. And our view was that when one of our schools was facing difficulties, its results had, had dipped and we were worried about what an inspection might, might say, then that collective responsibility of all of our leadership team to put the wagons in a circle around that school and support it was in the interest of the whole community. Because here's what happens, I think, in a community. When a school falls into special measures, not only is that absolutely disastrous for the school, it rocks the wider community who suddenly wonder whether their school is as good as they thought it was. And so we have to ensure that our best teachers and our best leaders have that impact more widely, I think, to, to try to make sure that schools are intervened before they fail, not when they fail. And I think the other side of what I've tried to do is to think about the, the notion of how do you systemize some of this stuff? So when I said before that one of the mistakes was that the autonomy was given to outstanding schools and weak schools in the same measure, um, there's no logic in doing that. But there is a logic in saying, actually, there is a good way to think about curriculum development. There is a good way to think about assessment and marking. There is a good way to think about developing our teachers. And we should use the best practice at our disposal to make that our trust practice. Now, that gets in the way of the autonomy debate. And actually, if you're telling me now to change the way I do business, you're now telling me that actually I've lost some of my autonomy. But if the structures and the systems are having a really demonstrable impact upon standards, then I think that's a really good conversation for trusts to have. 
On this one, I've talked a little bit more about the, the, the retention of talent. So, of course, there is a recruitment challenge in our system at the moment. But we have a recruitment challenge because we have a retention challenge. And in primary, it's in year three, at the end of year three. In secondary, it's the end of year four, where teachers leave in significant numbers. That's where the spike comes. But what the evidence is showing me is that in multi-academy trusts, who've been able to think about the career progression of staff and the development of staff to, to meet their own aspirations, the challenge of people leaving is not so great. So I think there is something about how the multi-academy trust vehicle is also a lever for how do we retain and develop our, our, our talent and our best teachers. A couple of points to, to, to round up, I suppose. I think we should rightly have the aspiration that education in this country is world class. And if I reflect upon the 20 years back from 1997 when I first became a head, I have no doubt that standards are better in this country than they were then. The challenge is that the rest of the, the world got better too. And so as a result of it, we've still got some real, I think, issues to do it. And what I'm trying to do here when I'm talking to education leaders in the system is to think about what I think some of the indicators will look like when we get to an education system that we think is world class. And you see, I'm not talking about data here. I'm not talking about Ofsted judgments. I'm talking about the culture that will sustain long-term improvement. So I won't, again, read them to you, but I'll pick on, on, on a couple of them that I think are particularly important. I think the first one I'd want to say is the third one down. We talk a lot in education about destinations. We talk about destinations in the context of social mobility. And that's the right thing to do. But destinations are sometimes talked about the end point of education, number of children going to universities, number of children getting high level apprenticeships, the kind of career opportunities we're opening up. Of course, that's important. But if I'm a 12 year old former self, my next destination is my 13th birthday and what I'm going to do next year, not what I'm going to do when I'm 18. And we just need to be really careful that in the pursuit of more youngsters going on to further higher education and, and, and employment with training, we don't lose sight of every destination on that route. I think the other one about that is a plug about early years teaching. There are two bookends for me in education. There's early years and there's 16 to 19. And if we can get those two ends to be really high quality, whilst it would be too simple to say the rest will take care of itself, it will be a really logical way to think about how we organise our system. So the, for me, the emphasis upon outstanding early years, nursery education, reception, phonics training, those early curriculum habits that young people need to get before they're seven or eight years old, if we get that right in this country, then in 25 years' time, you won't have somebody like me standing on a stage talking about intervention in our schools because we'll have created the framework uh, that we'll be able to be built upon as we go further forward. But the reality is some of that will take time. Uh, and for me, what I want to do during the duration of my contract in this role, which is for the next five years, is to address these priorities here. The first one is a really important one because it underpins a lot of the things I've said already, which is that every school in the country, I think, should be a giver and a receiver of support. So I don't know the level of uh, engagement you have with schools. I mean, it may well be as a parent as well as a professional. But if you've ever visited an outstanding school, it's brilliant. The reality, however, is not everything is brilliant. But there's enough good things happening to make sure that the less brilliant things are well managed. And if you've ever visited a special measure school, it's grim. But there will be pockets of brilliant practice in it. The challenge is there's not enough of it, and sometimes it's not in the right places. But the notion that only outstanding and good schools can help weak schools is wrong. I've had the privilege of leading schools to outstanding and taking schools from special measures to good. The special measures to good was a bigger learning curve than getting a school to outstanding, because you've got to fix almost everything. And those people, I think, can play a role in our education system as we go forward, further forward. And I, I've just pinched two slides that I used. Uh, I'm going to use them later in the week at a conference with chairs of governors in Manchester. And this is really about some work I've been doing with boards of trusts. And the questions I think they need to be asking themselves right now. Um, there's a sense that as the education uh, white paper from April has been walked back from, um, that people are saying, right, we don't need to think about academies anymore. We don't need to worry about multi-academy trust. All that's gone. The reality is that the ambition is still there, that we need to do something different in our system. Um, and the momentum that I'm seeing in the system, particularly through uh, a teacher board approvals, is that there are as many schools converting to become academies now as I've ever seen. In September, 237 new academies opened. That was the largest number of academies that we've seen in September since 2011, which you might remember was when the policy was introduced that schools could convert. But these are the questions that I think are really important that boards should be looking at and, and, and getting into. And the question four for me is fundamental. 
When I started being a head in 1997, the answer to that question was no. Because what happened as a group of head teachers in Gloucestershire, which shocked me when I moved into that group, was that a school that got into difficulties was seen as a feeding ground for students that would come to my better school and the best staff would come and work for me. So actually, you, you acid strip the weaker school in the community to make the better schools better. Thankfully, we've moved away from that in the main. But that's a really important question, I think, about what do you do about the school down the road that serves the same community as you do, that is not outstanding, but is providing a different level of educational support for young people. And on this one, I think there's something about the, the challenge for boards and governors around question six, and how do you know that your educational leaders are working on the right things? So if you think about the two key pillars in good governance, it's for me, number one, that conversion of the vision into an action plan, into a strategy that delivers the vision that the board has. And the second pillar is how do you hold people to account to deliver that? How, therefore, do you know that your leaders are not working on what they're interested in as opposed to what the core vision and belief is of the organisation? Uh, it's a question they'll find difficult, but it's an important one for to ask. So I hope in the short time that I've had with you this evening, I've just given you a, a very quick flavour and a walk through some of the things that I do as a national commissioner, uh, what I do with my team of RSCs across the eight regions, and to give you a sense of that the challenges are every bit as relevant to what I'm trying to do, even if the context is slightly different. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.